One of the topics that comes up tangentially, but perhaps crucially, in the uh, stimulus material is the idea of peak trade um, or peak globalization uh, and the concept of secular stagnation. Let's have a look at those in turn. The idea of peak trade is that we're reaching the uh, absolute maximum level uh, of trade as a percentage of GDP. Now, um, if you look carefully at the um, stimulus material, um, the suggestion is, is that trade has been growing and there's only a blip with the recession. But many people feel that um, uh, trade as a proportion of world GDP is reaching its limit. Connected with that, and similarly, people, some people think that the process of globalization, which is much talked about in the stimulus, has lost um, some impetus, and that um, we may be uh, near the um, maximum level of economic integration, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. And partly because of those two things, and partly uh, a cause of those two things, um, there is an idea that world growth uh, and particularly growth in major economies uh, such as uh, the United States and Western Europe um, has settled to a lower uh, long-run rate of growth. This is a phenomenon known as secular stagnation. Secular in this context, a very unusual word, means sort of not cyclical. So sort of like long-run or trend. The combination of trade peaking uh, globalization stalling and secular stagnation would be a very unhappy one, uh, not least for the developing countries like Zambia, which we're focusing on in this uh, stimulus material. So, let's have a look at the optimism in the stimulus material and let me bring to you some depressing uh, alternative possibilities as well. Have a look here at uh, these quotes from the introduction. Increasing globalization in number one. Reduction in trade barriers, um, which is a main uh, driver of ongoing globalization. And the idea that uh, the march of globalization, although faltering with the uh, Great uh, Recession, has um, uh, those fears are short lived, says the stimulus. And finally, balance of payments, imbalances have emerged. Maybe those imbalances are not just a temporary phenomenon but a more serious long-run thing. So having a look at number one here, globalization increasing at a rapid rate. Um, it was um, until 2008. But how much of that globalization was really driven by China? And now, and when we look at the data for China, we can see that Chinese growth is slowing. Um, we've had in the news recently uh, I'm recording this in January 2016. Uh, uh, does Chinese stock market be uh, suspended because of uh, instability there? And um, there's an enormous amount of overcapacity now in China. It's overinvested. Um, a real worry then that um, this massive increase in global trade, FDI, and so on, was really driven by uh, the power of China, and, and that might be slowing. Um, secondly, um, globalization uh, in terms of lower trade barriers, uh, as mentioned in the uh, stimulus, um, isn't working very well. In fact, the latest WTO round, the Doha Development Agenda, was started in 2001 with an intention that it would be finished by 2005-06. In fact, it's not really uh, led to any meaningful um, conclusion or major reforms in terms of freer global trade, um, even to this date. Uh, in 2013, a Bali Accord was signed, which was uh, an attempt to resuscitate um, the, the Doha coma, as it's called. Um, but um, it's a problem. And besides, um, is globalization still the kind of dominant force in uh, political and economic thinking that um, uh, the stimulus seems to imply. Many politicians uh, on the right in America and on the left in Europe seem to be very anti-globalization. And on the third uh, point here, that, um, that global um, trade was bouncing back, um, doesn't seem to be the case. If you look at the data, um, 
but we don't seem to have the quite the same high rates of growth as we had before the financial crisis, even if things have rebounded from that terrible negative growth period. And so um, there are many reasons for uh, sort of points in to bring up in the stimulus which we can question. The proper multilateral road to globalization has been through trade liberalization led by the World Trade Organization. But as I mentioned before, the Doha development agenda, the WTO round that started in 2001, has been a great disappointment and uh, at times has been um, so lacking in life that it's been described as the Doha coma. Certainly um, there was some optimism in 2013 where in Bali uh, a, a ministerial group uh, came to some sort of agreement but still um, uh, these multilateral uh, WTO rounds seem to have stalled. Many would say that globalization continues apace through regional trade agreements and as this paragraph uh, I've reproduced on this slide here shows you um, there's a debate as to whether um, regional trade agreements are taking away from globalization because they're creating little trade blocks or whether they're part of uh, the process towards albeit not on a global level. Um, but what I would war uh, warn you about is that things like the TPP and the TTIP uh, that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership um, are also um, need to be led by the United States of America. Without them, these big um, uh, trade agreements, including uh, the USA, will stall. And at this current moment in time, uh, they are struggling to get congressional approval and American politics is fairly gridlocked and besides, uh, certain uh, candidates are on both right and left are against it. It seems to be the sensible people in the middle who like these free trade agreements in America and none of those are going to get elected. Um, what about the idea of peak trade? Well, we're just looking here at the numbers. Um, the extract, uh, extract one now, um, says that um, that trade continues to grow, that fears of global trade wars quickly subsided and the growth in world trade recovered in 2010. Well, certainly trade bounces back from uh, the Great Recession, but if you look at the kind of gradient of global trade volumes before and after the Great Recession, you can see distinctly that trade appears to uh, have slowed in a long run sense. It is a bit wobbly and um, or anemic, as um, uh, my quotation at the top here says. Merchandise trade had been growing at 7% a year in the two decades uh, before the onset of the global financial crisis. Since then, um, uh, it's been anemic, 3.1% um, in 2014. So um, I think we should be very cautious in believing the positive uh, noises from the extract. I can see a bounce, but it isn't a bounce to the kind of trade growth that we had become used to. And uh, there is this question uh, that's absolutely crucial to keeping the world economy going and world trade uh, growing, uh, the, the role of China. Um, and if you look at the graph on the left here, now as a sort of explanation of the graph on the right that we've just been looking at, have a look at how important uh, China was, not just in terms of dr uh, producing masses of the world's exports, but also in sucking in many of the world's imports. But recently China has become uh, more self-sufficient in terms of the components and the capital used to manufacture all its goods, uh, developing more of a domestic market for these goods, and that is going to have a terrible impact on uh, other countries who rely on exporting to China. Never mind the overall slowdown um, uh, uh, in Chinese demand, which has led to the commodity markets uh, collapsing, and uh, the f way that that affects copper in particular is hugely harmful to Zambia. Uh, which is going to be a main part of your answers uh, about Zambia uh, when you talk about that in the um, in the in the exam. Why has China run out of puff in a long run sense? 
I'm thinking more than just the wobble that China is having at the moment in terms of growth. We're thinking of China's new normal being uh, much lower growth than we've been used to really since uh, 1990, which is coming on what for for a quarter of a century uh, when um, China joined the WTO. So a quarter of a century of super high growth in China, fueled by masses of investment. Look at the amount of GDFCF, that's fixed capital formation, what, what we call I, or investment really. Uh, Chinese uh, firms buying uh, new um, capital so they can expand, expanding their factories. Look at how high those levels are in, 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 in China between 1978 um, when it begins to uh, stop being communist uh, uh, to the present day, particularly since 1990 when it joined the WTO. The problem is, is that all that investment has eventually led to overcapacity. That means that the Chinese economy simply has more ability to produce than there is demand for the goods uh, that it's producing, and it means each individual firm is probably going to make a loss, which creates terrible instability uh, uh, in their economy and requires lower growth, and that will feed into even more uncertainty in China. The other thing that uh, is very worrying in terms of China uh, and the future is the massive level of debt um, that it's taken on principally in order to invest uh, and buy new factories, uh, just as, as we can see on the graph on the left. Look at the right. When we look at government debt, we look at the United States with 89% of GDP, or uh, you think of um, Japan with 200 odd percent of GDP. You look at the Chinese government debt or or national debt, and you say, "Well, 55 percent, not such a big deal." But then, if you look at how much debt it has in terms its in financial institutions, its corporations, who um, after all, who are tied up more with the state than they are in a truly democratic and capitalist country, uh, you find uh, it has a very high level. Of debt, and that is overhang is going to cause uh, retrenchment and lower growth in China, possibly, which will have a terrible effect on world growth. Which brings us on quite neatly to the idea of secular stagnation. This idea is that the long term potential growth of the world economy has declined. And why is it declined? Well, demographic reasons, technical reasons, uh, uh, and, and financial reasons, basically. Here's the graph. Um, that the Economist newspaper uh, wants to show us. Nominal GDP growth has slowed below 4% a year, Re real GDP growth below 2%. Um, if you look at the rates of growth in these major economies, um, then you can see that they are lower. And unless the developing economy can pick up the slack, which China has done for a while, but it looks like it won't, um, uh, things are going to look pretty bad for us. Demography. Well, the main reason uh, for secular stagnation, according to the people that believe this theory, is that the baby boomer generation, uh, the high population growth in Europe after the war, uh, has come and gone, and we're looking more and more at an aging population, which means fewer and fewer working people um, uh, looking after expensive elderly people who are not productive in the economy. This basically means that productivity is much lower than it would be without. The only saving grace for productivity in terms of demography is migration, um, but and without the enormous levels of migration into Europe and America over the last 50 years, we probably would have had real problems with um, uh, productivity, but for various reasons, um, the aging population is, rise, is, is becoming more of a problem even at the rates of migration we have, and that, that I would suggest, suggest to you there's little political uh, will for further migration in order to increase productivity. The second reason is technology, and this is quite a complicated one but um, uh, to, to know if it's true, but there is a suggestion that we've sort of reached peak innovation, if you like, that um, uh, Innovation and technological change happens in great clusters and what we call paradigm shifts in science. Um, something like the internet has now sort of fed through and unless there's another great big wave of innovation, we'll see slower rates of technical change. In other words, uh, sort of science doesn't move in straight lines and, and um, we're now just sort of at the fag end of a scientific revolution, a technical re revolution to do with IT 
and we'll get slower growth because technology is sort of run out of steam. And finally, financial instability. This is really about the debt overhang um, uh, thanks to the cycle of credit boom and credit bust. We could end up with a debt deflation uh, vicious circle where no one wants to spend uh, so uh, prices fall which means that the real value of debt continues to rise so no one's got any money to spend uh, rather uh, like the sort of decade or decade and a half of gloom uh, and secular stagnation that's affected Japan that might now affect Europe and America too rather depressing thought. Tied in with that is that this era of new low interest rates means there's very little room for um, the central banks of countries to stimulate economies and the idea that um, the um, financial uh, bubble, uh, the bubbles in the housing market and asset prices like shares, dot-com bubbles, in the last 10-15 years only those bubbles of, of borrowing and uh, asset inflation have kept demand going and that w when they burst as they must inevitably do because they're built on air um, what's left is, is is no real massive productive increase uh, in the capacity of the economy um, this contrasts with bubbles like the railway boom and bonanza uh, uh, of the uh, late 19th century where at least after the bubble burst they were left with some serious um, physical capital to, to build uh, an infrastructure. So this secular stagnation problem would be uh, exacerbate the problem of peak trade and the problem of peak trade uh, and lower trade growth will lead to lower productivity growth and, and lower demand coming externally into countries so that we'd have lower GDP growth. In other words a vicious circle like the top left of this slide here. Um, Additionally, if the long-run elasticity of trade with respect to GDP is, sh is shrinking, as it seems to, that means that um, uh, you know, as, as um, trade slows, GDP will slow even more. So um, lots and lots of really depressing things to think about, um, but uh, if it's any consolation, I, I think you could make a completely opposite argument. I'm quite optimistic about the long-run future. I'm not sure I buy into secular stagnation, but uh, it's for you to work out um, w why I think that. There are certainly some arguments here and some worries about what is the new normal. And uh, from the evidence I've presented today, the new normal I is certainly not as optimistic as suggested in the uh, stimulus material. Good luck. <laughs>